This is another case from the town of Itaewon in South Korea. Today, Itaewon is known as a hip foreign town, but the image of the foreigner's towns have really changed since the 90s and early 2000s. Unfortunately, today's case is another infamous case that has been forgotten. Two American exchange students in Korea for a fun and educational time of their life. One murdered and one a pointed suspect. But is she the suspect? The suspect of this brutal crime is still somewhere out there and living among us. So by now, you guys probably have heard of the town Itaewon in South Korea. But before that, and still today it is, Itaewon is known as a very hip foreigner's town. You can get American food and various ethnic foods that you can't get anywhere else in South Korea. Korea is not a vegan country, but in Itaewon, you can find a lot of vegan stores. But did you know that back in the 90s and 2000s, Itaewon did have a very bad image and it was known to be one of the dangerous ghetto towns that was known to Koreans. Now, this was because there was a U.S. military base in Yongsan, which is right next to Itaewon. I believe the U.S. military did move out of Yongsan, so it's no longer there. But up till only a couple years ago, Yongsan did have a military base. And because of that, Itaewon was known to be a hot place for military soldiers. So that's kind of where the foreign town trend started. But because it was known as a foreign town to South Koreans, there was an image that foreigners were wild, that they caused a lot of trouble, that they're loud. Just a really bad stereotype of foreigners in this town. And you guys probably know the infamous Itaewon case where the suspect Arthur Patterson and his friend was suspected of murdering a Korean man back in, I believe, the 90s. And Arthur Patterson was found guilty over 20 years later and was extradited to Korea and sentenced to over 20 years in jail. Today's case also happened in Itaewon in 2001. Not as famous as Arthur Patterson's case. It's been kind of buried, so I I wanted to bring this case back to light. Mr. Tom Barnes that I've interviewed, he was a CID officer in South Korea, now retired. He emailed me about this case that he's worked on. And because Arthur Patterson has been found over 20 years later, I believe by talking about this case, we can have high hopes one day finding the suspect even 20 years later. So big thank you to Mr. Barnes for letting me know about this case. And remember, if you like these hidden cases or cases that are buried that needs to be brought back to light, hit the like button, share this video. Remember the suspect is somewhere out there. We can put all our energy and put it out into the universe hoping that we can also help bring this case back to justice. So back in 2001, there was a motel named K Motel somewhere in the town of Itaewon. Now this was an old building, an old motel, and apparently this was kind of like how Itaewon was and still is. If you go to certain places in Itaewon, it's very old buildings. And again, Itaewon was not like a new hip town yet. People also say in the 90s and early 2000s, there was a lot of red rooms. And because there were a lot of foreigners, it was also a lot of drug dealings that went on in Itaewon. So there was a group of female exchange students that came from all over the world. They were studying at a university somewhere about 120 miles away from Seoul. Now there was a friend group of seven females that decided that, hey, it's almost St. Patrick's Day. Let's go all the way up to Seoul and see what Seoul is all about. We're in South Korea. Let's spend the weekend there. Now this particular weekend was a St. Patrick's weekend. Obviously St. Patrick's Day is celebrated in America, not in Korea, but because it's a foreigner's town, that's where you'll go to have like Halloween parties, Thanksgiving parties, St. Patrick's Day. It was a night of drinking, having fun, and they say that it was pretty crowded again because of the holiday weekend. And the girls even say that they flirted with some military sergeants that they met at particular bars. And one of the girls from the friend group, Kenzie, says that her friend Jamie, she even saw her kiss one of the boys during this dance party. Jamie Lynn Pench was a 19 year old American exchange student from Pennsylvania and Kenzie was a 19 year old exchange student from West Virginia. Now Jamie and Kenzie were kind of like the buddies for the night. They were hanging out together of course with other friend groups but the other girls decided to go home early because they were tired. They had a lot to drink and Jamie and Kenzie stayed a little bit longer and decided to drink a little more. Now according to Kenzie as she was hanging out with Jamie and these military men, the military men asked the girls Jamie and Kenzie if they would like to stay and go to another bar. But Kenzie says that she declined because they were tired and decided to go home. She started talking to a guy named Vince. Because she could tell he was lonely because it didn't take him long for him to invite me down to there's an island south of Korea, Chechu. And he's like, you just have to spend the night with me. Jamie and I were dancing with some guys. They were all going to go over to a club called Stompers. 
And so these guys asked us to go and we declined. That was when Jamie and I decided to leave. And to circle back, the girls, the seven girls were staying at the K motel that I talked about. Now, both the girls weren't heavily drunk. They were very tipsy. Later on, we will find evidence that they drank up to about 0.11% blood alcohol level. Alcohol does affect person to person differently, but 0.11 at least wasn't like crazy drunk. It was about tipsy, making you feel good, but you weren't totally out of it. Now, Kenzie and Jamie finally arrived at the motel and according to Kenzie who was the last person to see Jamie alive says that she followed Jamie to her room 103 to make sure that she was okay according to Kenzie Jamie said that she wanted to take a shower before she went to sleep to sober up and as they went inside Jamie's room Jamie said shh Anna is sleeping, I have to be quiet. So Jamie did have a roommate of the day, which was Anna. So Jamie and Anna was staying at room 103. Kenzie was staying at a different room, but wanted to drop her friend off. So really important, Jamie's roommate Anna was sleeping and was inside their motel room at the time. Now I cannot find exactly what time they came back, but it is said that they came in sometime between 1 to 4 a.m. Now here is a map of how these motel rooms look like. This was a old cheap motel you guys this is almost like a one room so it did have a bathroom right here right as you walk in and right as you walk in you see the bed so this is a small tiny room walls are thin you could hear everything it's a small one room i mean probably even a little claustrophobic for two people now according to kenzie the last memory that she has of jamie she was about to take a shower also to remind you these old motels their security was like zero then she says that she went back to her room because she knew that her friend was fine she was gonna take a shower an interesting thing kenzie says that when she went back to her room which she was staying with her boyfriend at the time which was i believe on the same floor so not too far away she says that she was about to go to sleep and decided to check up on jamie one more time which is interesting like you're both are kind of drunk like you know your friend went into the room safely but she decided to go and check up on her again so a couple minutes later according to kenzie she says that she went back to room 103 she opened the door so i guess they didn't lock it and she says that she heard someone taking a shower and assumed that it was jamie she finally knew that everything was okay and decided to fall asleep and woke up the next day so now the morning of march 18th 2001 around 8 a.m in room 103 anna jamie's roommate would wake up and says that she screamed because she saw a woman lying on the floor unconscious. She could not confirm that this was her roommate Jamie because there was like a black jacket on top of this person's face. Anna says that she went out to get the other girls frantic and went downstairs to ask the front desk lady to help call the police. The front lady told them where the police was. They ran to the police station, the nearest that they can find, alerted them, and police came to the motel around 8.30 a.m. When police entered room 103, the woman was found completely clothless. There was blood everywhere, and again, a black jacket that was covering the face. Her undergarments were left, some in the bathroom, some outside where she was found, and what looked like some boot footprints on the ground. Police uncovered the jacket to try and see who it was, and it's very sad because they actually said that she was in such a bad condition on her face that they couldn't even identify her. So somebody had hit her, stomped on her, whatever it was so bad that they couldn't even identify her. Friends said that if this is Jamie, she should have a United States tattoo on her back and police did confirm that this woman did have the United States tattoo and it was confirmed that it was Jamie. Like you would have to have a heavy immense power for you to do that, I'm imagining. Blood alcohol, again, was found to be 0.11. So in most countries and states, that's above the legal limit to drive. But again, according to professionals, that is not like full on drunk at all. It's tipsy making you feel good up to that point. Autopsy also showed that there was no evidence of defense wounds, meaning that she most likely did not see this coming or had the ability to fight back. So that could tell you something about the scenario. 
Maybe it was someone she knew, maybe it wasn't. But because still she was technically under the influence, that could be one of the reasons why she didn't have time to fight back. There was also no evidence of S assault that was found, which is interesting. Um, they also did a drug test and nothing came up. Now the American CID officers, which is the criminal investigation department in US military that is stationed in South Korea, did take over this case because it happened to American students. Now they did criticize the Korean police of having a very poor job in gathering the evidence and taking care of the crime scene because they do believe that still to this day they're unsure if the footprints or at least some of them was actually the police and not the suspect because the evidence was mixed up like that that did kind of hinder the investigation and it could have been the suspect or it could have been the police like because later on actually before they were able to analyze that the motel staff came in and cleaned the room so that's very unfortunate and according to the CID officers the Korean police did gather something that could have been the suspect they did find hair and blood samples that did not belong to Jamie or Anna. This was a type A blood and Jamie and Anna did not have A type blood. And back in 2001, apparently in South Korea, they still did not have high DNA technology. They could only figure out the type of blood. They did have DNA testing, but it was not reliable yet. I don't know if they still have that evidence with them somewhere stashed in the compartments, but they should definitely retest that. Now, Jamie's pants was found inside of the bathroom and her bra and socks were found outside where she was found unalive. Interesting thing is her bra and socks were wet with blood and her feet was also wet with blood. And according to criminal profilers, by looking at the pictures, it could be a possibility that somebody had to take off her socks and garments in order for it to be bloody and left out in that state. Stayed, which is also interesting because they did not find any evidence that she was as assaulted. So why would the person have to take off her socks and undergarments like after the fact that they have done this? Now there were a few witnesses and we will get to the roommate because I'm sure you guys are curious about that. Now, there were two witnesses that was outside of room 103. A motel guest and a motel staff says that they believe they saw a white male standing in front of room 103. Now, if it's room 103, I believe that's the first floor. So definitely people could have heard or seen something. And the motel staff says that she believes she saw again a pale man with blood spatters on his pants. That's all she remembers. Or maybe she did and she was kind of used to that like rowdy part of Itaewon so she didn't think anything of it. But it gets me to think how did this motel staff not hear anything when literally a crazy murder was going on like there's no way you could stop a person like that and not hear anything which is mind baffling to me now right next door was room 102 where one of the other girls and her boyfriend decided to stay now the female student in room 102 claims that at around 4 15 a.m she was awoken by a loud noise especially of a man speaking in english and yelling she also says she heard someone say let's go does that mean that the suspect could have been two people and not one? Or was the suspect talking to the victim? The female student and her boyfriend says that they did not go out to see if everything was okay because the walls were so thin that this could have came from upstairs, maybe the other next door and not particularly 103. Now I'm thinking, did someone follow Jamie and Kenzie all the way to the motel? But remember, Kenzie says that she went back to check on Jamie, meaning that she could have seen somebody standing out there but she never reported that. So could it even be possible that random people would find a random room 103 and attack a random person? How did they know that it was females only staying in that room? So that is definitely a mystery as well. While editing, I did think about the possibility that it could have been random strangers. Since Arthur Patterson's case was about two boys randomly attacking a random stranger they had no relation with. So I think this case also has a possibility that it could have been someone that they did not know. Now, the crazy thing is that the witness, or should be a witness, Anna, Jamie's roommate that was sleeping inside of the room, claims that she didn't hear a thing which is literally mind baffling. And later on when investigators asked her, like, how, how did you sleep through that? According to Anna, she says that she usually is a deep sleeper, 
But because she drank that day and had a party, like she just completely knocked out and didn't hear a thing. Look, I've seen deep sleepers before. Like my brother, I know he's a deep sleeper. He sleeps through like anything. I'm a very, very light sleeper. And even if I was drunk, like, if you are having somebody literally right in front of you, this happened a foot or two, a foot or two from the bed that she was sleeping in. Like, I think I would wake up. Like if somebody was literally unaliving someone, that just, I mean, can that be done in quiet? I don't know. Now, Kenzie, the last person to see Jamie alive, cooperated with the police, the CID officers, and she gave the names of the men that she hung out with that day with Jamie, the military men. And I believe one of the men that she pointed out was a guy named Vincent that she hung out with, particularly at the bar. The CID officers did take the DNA, shoe sizes, and even the lie detector tests of the boys. And according to both Korean and CID officers, they cleared them. Now, police originally said that the footprint that they found next to Jamie was 270 centimeters or about US men's shoe size nine. And it was most likely a walker boot type. Something that yes, the military guys wear often walker boots but again this evidence is shaky because it was tampered by the police it could have been the police shoe print that's again very unfortunate now from here after the case the foreign exchange students by one by one did go back home and this case was left cold and jamie's parents back into the u.s were frustrated that their daughter was unalive in a foreign country on the day that she was supposed to be having fun in such a sad sad way and there was no suspect Jamie's parents asked the senator of the United States that was going to South Korea to have a meeting with the Korean president, and they were successful. The senator did plead with the Korean president to try and push this case farther. So the US investigators, including the FBI, decided to take a look at this case. Now, when they were going through all the evidence, the FBI started to look at Kenzie as suspicious. Kenzie, Jamie's friend and that party buddy of the day. And according to the Korean police and CID originally, they even said that there was no evidence that Jamie ended up taking a shower because the bathtub and her body was dry when she was found. And police did a test to see if the water would dry within the five, six hours that it took for them to discover her. And in this test, they say that even six hours later, the water did not dry even half inside of the bathtub. So this means that Jamie actually did not end up taking a shower as Kenzie said. Now here's a photo from the bathtub. I mean, it is pretty blurry. I can't find a high definition picture of it. And FBI doubted the statement that Kenzie says that she saw Jamie take off her clothing outside before she went into the bathroom and told Kenzie that she was gonna take a shower because her pants were found inside of the bathroom. So those little details was something that FBI wanted to take a look at. And one of the biggest question and doubt that they had towards Kenzie was why did she go back to check on her friend the second time? I mean, she already saw her go in. She was fine. She was about to take a shower. I mean, you both just had a long night. I mean, you were about to lay your head on the pillow and then go check up on her. Like they just couldn't see why she had to go back again. Like, was she just an amazing friend? I mean, I thought about it and I'm like, you know, I wouldn't have gone back either. I took her to her room, saw her take a shower. I am also tired. I'm about to lay in bed. I will probably go to sleep is what most normal people would say. But again, different for different people. So FBI started to really point Kenzie as the suspect. In these photos, you see that Kenzie was a lot bigger than Jamie. Now, originally it was reported that Jamie was 167 centimeters, 54 kilograms. Kenzie was about 170 centimeters and 91 kilograms. But according to this picture, she's a lot taller than Jamie than just by three centimeters. So, and according to Jamie, Jamie's parents a week prior to the case, Jamie told her parents that there was a girl at her school that was bothering her. There was no other details to what she referred to specifically. Was it a Korean student? Was it an American student that she was hanging out with? No details about that. With everything that they've gathered, FBI came up with the theory 
that Jamie and Kenzie could have been in a homosexual dynamic. Now about a year went by and Kenzie and of course other students went back to their hometown. Kenzie was back in her school in West Virginia. An FBI contacted Kenzie back and told her, hey, we're still trying to figure this out. Would you mind helping us as a witness? So Kenzie was under the impression that she was still trying to help her friend murder be solved. And three FBI agents invited Kenzie to a hotel room in Virginia near where her school was. Which is interesting because the FBI did not call her to the police station interrogation room where there were tapes. You know, nothing was filmed at all. They just called her to a hotel room. And this was a tactic that FBI used to try and get Kenzie to confess or to say more information than what she possibly could have told them. Kenzie claims that at first, the first day, you know, the FBI was really nice. Hey, how are you? I'm checking up on you. Are you okay since that incident? How was your schoolwork? And apparently Kenzie felt really calm that they were her friends and she trusted them. She also says that one of the investigators even told her, you're like my sister sister. The second day, she says that she even felt so comfortable that she even took ice cream to the hotel room to try and, you know, remember what she saw and felt that day to try and get the suspect. But the second day, this is when she says that she was hammered with tough questions by the FBI pointing to her as the suspect. Kenzie says that the FBI started to show her photos and videos of the crime scene and asked her certain questions and, and phrased the question specifically to try and say that you are the suspect. What happened that day? Kenzie says that the way they questioned her was like, what was she wearing at the time you saw her? She said she was wearing underwear and a bra. The FBI would say, no, that's not right. So they would show her photos and videos and say that we have evidence against you. What you said as a witness is not right. It was wrong. It does not match up to the evidence they found and try to get her to doubt her memories. The officers then started to push the story to her saying, hey, were you guys lesbian couple or were you guys into each other? What happened? like nothing happened. And so when he's asking this, I have this like black cloud in my head. And I'm thinking, well, I don't remember if I did it. So maybe Jamie did it. Well, then I guess she kissed me first. Now, according to Kenzie, she kind of described this as an odd power being taken away kind of feeling. And she said to herself, I don't remember me doing it. So I guess Jamie had to kiss me. And this is kind of how the interrogation started to go. She started to say something, they would say no. She would try to recollect the memories and they would give her like a story and ask her certain questions. And she started to kind of go off of what they were claiming that she did. According to Kenzie, it was as if she was started to manipulate her own memories to match what they wanted the story to be. Kenzie says that at this time she needed a break. She left for a couple hours, two hours, came back and asked the officers, would I need a lawyer? Then the officer said, you can get a lawyer, but we can't say you cooperated. So I guess being a 19, 20 years old, you know, she was under almost like a very pressure fear tactic that has never happened to her before. And according to FBI, Kenzie went on about a story of how Jamie wanted to touch her behind. Kenzie got mad. She hit Jamie and Jamie hit against the wall and fell. Did you stomp her? The officer says. Kenzie said to herself, did I? Well, did I stomp her? And started to question herself and her memories, but also at the same time started to confess. Overall claims that this was a spontaneous thing that happened at a fit of rage because Jamie was trying to hit on her. Now the third day, FBI asked her to write a confession. According to Kenzie in a podcast she did later on um, more recently in 2019, quote, it's as if I have almost two memories. One, a memory with colors, emotions, and sounds. And the other is like images put together black and white. Kenzie says that she did not have a great relationship with her parents, so she couldn't talk to them about this. And she also says that she couldn't tell her friends about this. I mean, this was a huge, big deal for her. I mean, for anyone to go through. Three weeks since her interrogation, she was arrested and she was actually one of the first Americans, I believe, to be extradited to Korea for a murder charge. Now, once she was in Korea, because she technically confessed, in Korea, you had to do something called a live reenactment. This is part of the trials and evidence where the suspects have to reenact what they did. And at the reenactment, when she went back to that motel, she says that this is when she knew 100% that she did not do it and that the memories in her mind was totally different. And to the Korean police now, she had to confess again, but she refused to do so. It was very telling for me, at least when she was doing the reenactment of the crime in that bathroom, 
that she actually corrected a South Korean police officer who was acting as a victim. She corrected the position of the head. And later when I said that if you weren't there, how could you even do that? And her answer was she was getting in the spirit of the reenactment. It leaves me no doubt that uh, she uh, confessed to the true crime. And she said, quote, when they were getting agitated at me for not confessing, I didn't want to lose that control again. Referring to how being under immense pressure can lead to a false memory being implanted like a brainwashing. They didn't have any physical evidence that she ended her friend's life. Now, according to the witnesses and police, originally they say that Kenzie had the same clothes on the next day that she had at the party the night before, and she did not have any blood or any stains on her clothing. Which, if she had the same clothes on, I mean, she should have blood on her shoes, on her clothing, if she was a suspect. Why did you confess? Because they said they had evidence against me. So? And they said that if I what cooperated evidence? with them, that it would be easier on me. In what way? I was trying to cooperate. By giving a confession? By helping. If I spilled the milk, I was going to clean it up. Right. They said that I had done it. I don't remember doing it. I didn't do it. Now, she was in Korea for months as she was awaiting her trial. And in the first trial, because she did not, where she refused to confess again to the Korean police, and with no physical evidence, they found her not guilty. But prosecutors appealed the case and she was awaiting for the second trial, which overall took about six months and that came back as not guilty as well. Now, at least in the Supreme Court trial, she was able to go back to America and wait, which the entire thing took about three years. And finally, the verdict was that she was found not guilty guilty. Now in this older documentary with Nancy Grace, Jamie's parents said that they were upset Kenzie walk free because, you know, they did think that she was a suspect according to the FBI. And Anna, Jamie's roommate, says that she can't be sure to say that Kenzie can be a killer because she was known to be a very nice girl. She cooperated with the Korean police originally, just like every other witnesses. But of course, someone being pointed that you did something and you're on trial for it, People will see you differently even if they can't see you actually doing that. This is really interesting because this has happened time and time again where mind control, brainwashing, implanting a false memory is a thing and especially for those who might have a weaker consciousness or you know, especially if you're young like a 19 year old who don't have experience like this. It's one of the reasons why like people can fall into these interrogations because they can implant something that you didn't do or coerce you into seeing something under pressure. One of the reasons why she says that she, regret, she regrets that she did not actually get a lawyer. She tried to, but you know, the FBI twisted the words to say, hey, if you get a lawyer, well, it might look bad for you during the trial. And Kenzie was actually on a podcast called Wrongful Conviction. And she says that her goal of speaking up, which she did not want to originally, was to educate people about the fact that wrongful convictions do happen. People need to know and be educated about your rights if you happen to be in a situation like she did. I personally haven't interrogated by the police as well I'll talk about it in a bit but it is a intense thing you guys and i can see how people can be coerced into saying these things but story time at the end so what could have happened then if kenzie was not the suspect now it's interesting because jamie was found completely clothless but there was no evidence of s assault and the way she was found was found with so much anger and passion that somebody had to just randomly do this. Now, could it be that these military guys got maybe angry that these girls wouldn't come with them and decided to follow them and kind of like stalk them? Maybe they didn't follow them right behind them, but saw where their rooms were, kind of waited outside of the motel. And as Jamie was about to take a shower, maybe they got angry and decided to do this. Maybe they were drunk and were on drugs maybe and decided to do something crazy. So does that mean Kenzie's memory that she went back to check on her friend is also false or it is true but where did that shower noise come from now is kenzie's memories all screwed up now but she did say this original testimony when she was first just a witness when this case happened i have to say your memories at least in the first witness statement had to be the most correct and as time goes by you know your memories get more cloudy and again i i just believe that it's crazy how anna the roommate and why was she okay i mean why didn't they attack her i mean 
if she could have been a possible witness. Maybe they did see that she was sleeping, but you know, maybe she was pretending. Who knows? And if the people right next door in room 102 heard a loud noise at 4.15 a.m. in the morning, why didn't anybody else hear it? And the last thing, did Kenzie really not do it. I mean, her statements to the police and what happened is pretty crazy. I mean, it is totally possible that especially if you're under the influence, you know, and someone's inside of the bathroom, maybe she thought she heard the shower running, but she actually didn't. Another thing that discredited Kenzie was that Kenzie asked Jamie, are you okay when she went back? And she claims that she heard Jamie say, I'm okay. And she left. According to the police, when they did the testing, they said that they cannot hear the other person when the person's inside of the bathroom. So Kenzie could not have heard someone say, I'm okay, but are these testings 100% reliable? Maybe, maybe not. With the amount of force that Jamie was found in her state, I don't know if a female would could have done that. And I mean, if there was a loud female cat fight, I believe people would have also heard that. Kenzie was a lot bigger than Jamie. It could have been, but I mean, they would have found some blood evidence outside or inside of Kenzie's room or something. Now, Kenzie is a mom now. 22 years later, she says that she still has to monitor her behavior because this title of a suspect, a murderer, still follows her even if she was found not guilty. She says that even her son having a play date with other people at her son's classmates' houses. She felt sometimes obligated to tell her about the past to make sure that she's honest. And she says that one time she told this to her son's friend's mom and they actually cut her off, like no more play dates with her son. Yeah, I get it. There's always doubts because guilty people can be released without no physical evidence. So people might feel iffy around people who might've been pointed as murder suspects. And I believe she tried to sue the FBI as well for the false confession later on through the United United States court, but the case was dismissed. The crazy thing is you guys, whoever has done this to Jamie, beautiful 19 year old, young, bright, smart woman is still out there. That just gives me the chills that the CID originally look over the male suspects. Can DNA testing be done over 20 years later? Let's try to help this case and bring Jamie's parents and Jamie the justice that she deserves. Because again, the suspect is out there living among us. But again, my personal story time, I also was investigated by the Korean police for a certain thing that someone reported me on and they really ham on you. And they really like reword the question. You know your rights, like they read you the rights, but because you're under so much immense pressure, you're like, I'm innocent. Just under this weird pressure and you know they're the authorities, they have the power to maybe put you in jail and you just have this like cloud of fear over you. And especially if they say, we have evidence of this and that, like you're like, oh my God. And if you do not have the strong mental capacity and strength, like it will break you down because you will forget about your rights as people are pressuring you. And it's really a mind game when it comes to these things. Share and like this video so that we can reach as many people as we can. Thank you for watching and see you on my next video.